स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Good morning. We begin today's class, and we'll talk about Oethier theory in Hollywood. So I'm sure uh, most of you remember we have done Oethierism in France, and who was the originator of uh, the Oethier theory in France? Bezant. Good. Andre Bezant in France, Cahiers du Cinema, and uh, what was the idea all about? That uh, the director is the captain of the ship, giving more power to. the directors that's the idea so key concepts today's in today's class would be authorism and discussing it in the american context how authors make use of mise en scene and what could be their signature style key people would be andrew sarris who gave us the theory of authorism in hollywood in for american cinema ranjit was telling me the other day he read up uh, on andrew andrew sarris a few days back and he died in 2012 okay so please do look up on andrew sarris and howard hawks as an author but i am not going into too, ma uh, too much depth i am going to particularly focus on alfred hitchcock cinema i had already asked you to come having watched some of his major movies including rope so uh, uh, how did the concept originate i am giving you a brief historical overview in 1910 the british magazine bioscope identified some directors as special so we are talking about as early as in 1910 remember cinema is very uh, was still in its very early stages it began in 1885 and 1910 bioscope already identified some directors as a class apart in germany the term autoren film was used during the same period uh, film maker and novelist and this we have already talked about alexander astro who coined the term camera pen that means camera if camera is a pen director is the author okay so this is the connection astro wanted to raise the status of cinema from a working class form of entertainment to high art form there are many people who regard cinema uh, okay what is there in cinema it is just a time pass affair but uh, people like astro and bezon and later on paul and keel and and dusaris they try to elevate the status of cinema from just a uh, very lower mode of entertainment to high art about about alexander astro astro's article la camera stilo camera pen stilo pen 1948 called for a new language in film making and he uh, the upshot of which was that camera should be used the way authors use their pens he posited that film makers should make more personal kinds of cinema and this is something that you will find in the works of authors personal kinds of cinema and when vimal you are talking about new hollywood cinema they are all about personal cinema we talked about capola the other day while discussing the godfather personal film making something that reflect the personality of the filmmaker we have already talked about trufo i am just doing a quick recap and then lead you towards uh, the major author that we are going to discuss that's hitchcock so uh, we have uh, uh, referred to his 1954 essay trufos Yun certain tendance du cinema français a certain tendency in french cinema where overarching principles are that mise en scene is crucial to the reading of cinema we discussed mise en scene while talking about melodrama remember douglas sirk how he would construct the scene the mise en scene in such a way that it tells you you know he the use of color the use of sets actors that he would invariably cast rock hudson was his favorite yeah so that's mise en scene sound music cinematography they all express a personal like a personal style another feature the director's personal expression is key in distinguishing whether they should be called directors 
So, there has to be a signature style. So, those are the principles as posited by Francois Truffaut. Now, what is mise en scene? Most of you are already familiar with and soon I am going to show you a clipping and you have to identify mise en scene. Okay? So, mise en scene crudely put uh, identifies set and design, set design and props, the way certain things are used. In rope, which is the major prop? If you have watched, yes? Chest. Yeah. So, chest is the major prop and rope of course. Yeah. Lighting and shadow, how various directors make use of. Watch Martin Scorsese, you see the way he uses lights. Acting and how certain directors make the, uh, actors act in a certain way. For Hitchcock, directors were not, uh, sorry, actors were not very important. What did he call them? Actors are all the word cattle. Okay. Hitchcock used the term very boldly cattle for actors. He said that they are all alike, it is me who controls the movie. Okay. Costume and makeup. Mise en in other words, is understood by the use of costume, makeup, set design, props, lighting within a single scene and explains how these elements contribute to the narrative. So, it is very important to understand uh, mise en scene. Think of uh, some of our own Indian directors, think the cinema of Satyajit Ray and how important it was, mise en scene was in his films. Okay. Um, a lady of the from an aristocratic household wearing bangles in Pathir Panchali, this denotes something. Whereas, you are shown the, the, the wrist, the naked wrist of the lady from a poorer section of society and juxtaposed together. What does it mean? Sh shows the class difference. Okay, so, that is a very good example of mise en scene. Uh, so, authors are different from maître en scene. Maître en scene are just those people who are hired to direct a movie. They are not authors. They put together a scene. Vimal, you know these things? Maître en scene. Okay. So, th there is no personal style of a filmmaker. He is just, in other words, uh, uh, of some person who puts together a scene. So, the distinction between author and maître en scene was introduced by Kyle's critics. And again, I am repeating myself according to the, these critics, an author should necessarily display a distinct sense of personal vision, a signature style, a subjective style. Andrew Saris, 1928 to 2012, he was the leading American proponent, a critic of author theory, who wrote for the village voice. Village voice is a is a magazine, is a kind of a, a very important newspaper. So, director is the sole author of his work, that is what he believed in. And this is regardless and this is very bold now, this is very forward. This is regardless of the contribution the writers, producers or actors make. And new Hollywood, again we are uh, gearing towards it. Now, next classes onwards, we are going to start with a reading of new Hollywood cinema. So, I urge you to come having watched Bonnie and Clyde, Chinatown, American Graffiti by who? Good, George Lucas, Easy Rider, If possible, uh, watch uh, Shampoo, Warren Beatty's. I do not know if it will be available. Shampoo, Shampoo, you wash your hair with shampoo. Okay. So, Andrew Saris later uh, uh, ranked directors such as John Ford higher than someone like William Wyler. Okay. So, that is Saris's own opinion. For example, <coughs> see all these critics 
had major biases. For example, Pauline Keel was the one who made people like Warren Beatty, Robert Altman and later on Martin Scorsese. She never liked Coppola though. Uh, Ceres's The American Cinema maps the history of the talking picture period up to 1968 into 11 categories of filmmakers with titles like Pantheon Directors, Strained Seriousness and Lightly Likeable. So, some are seriously likeable and some are lightly likeable. So, it is up to you um, if you want to agree or disagree with his list. And each category files directors alphabetized names and filmographies with analysis of the distinctive personality or lack of personality of each director's body of work. Saris is also known for constructing three concentric circle and this is an author theory model and uh, outside on the outer circle you have technical competence followed by personal style and at the core of each author is an interior meaning, a core thematic concern. So, that is what that is the model uh, Andrew Cyrus proposes it and, it and it works. You know technical competence there has to be some kind of a style, technical style. Then personal style, it can even mean the kind of team you create for yourself, the kind of people you collaborate because you are certain kind of a filmmaker. So, you want to work with only these people, Douglas Sirk and Rock Hudson combination. Why did he want an extremely good looking actor for all his films? There must have been a reason, John Ford and John Wayne, why did John Ford want only him? Howard Hawks and often Humphrey Bogart and Cary Grant. So, the uh, hyper masculine actors of those that particular age and what was the interior meaning implicit in there. So, um, Andrew Saris's choices this is just an overview and I want you to be familiar with the uh, with some great works in international cinema. Uh, this is the list he gives in 1962. Ugetsu you remember when we were doing Japanese cinema we talked about Yugetsu, Tales of Yugetsu. Lola Montes you are already familiar with, who directed? Good, Max Ophels. Regle de Jeu you have done, who directed? Jean Renoir, L'Atlante, Jean Vigeau, The Great Dictator, Chaplin, The Magnificent Embassies, Shadow of a Doubt, Magnificent Embassies, Oscar, Oscar uh, Orson Welles. Shadow of a Doubt, Hitchcock, Nuit and Buller, that is a French movie, and Tir Sur la Piano, Shoot the Piano, player by Truffaut, Aboud the Souffle by Godard. So, this is Andrew Cyrus's definitive uh, list of definitive movies, but then it is 62, and of course, you would not have some of the more contemporary filmmakers. But this is, I am often asked, tell us what to watch. So, this is how canons are created. Remember, we have already gone through the process of creation of a canon. So, this is a canonical list. If you want to understand cinema, go through this. See if the movies that you are doing, they have echoes of these films. It is important to understand. Now, problematizing the author. Again, I am quoting Saris. Why is an author a problematic category? Because see, then what happens to someone as important as an actor? I mean, think Tamil cinema and think how our industry works. Yeah, uh, even Bollywood, maybe things are changing off late, but they have not al always been like that. I mean, I can give you example from my personal experience. There was a time in during the late 70s and 80s, anything starring Amitabh Bachchan would be a mega success regardless of the product, the quality of the product. So, uh, people would just uh, um, uh, you know line up for any movie starring Amitabh Bachchan and similar is the case down south. You have a particular star 
and people would go for that. So, so what happens to this category called actor? Then how come we say that pro act authors are so important? When actors are definitely the ones who draw in the audience. Cinematography, you often talk about Mani Ratnam and Raji Menon or Santosh Sivan collaboration. They are the ones who give vision, you know, who, who implement the director's vision, who execute the director's vision. So, it is very important because they are the ones who focus on visual style, lend the movie a depth of field. So, it is important to understand that why cinematographers are so important, Gordon Willis and Coppola. In spite of all their differences during the making of the first Godfather, he still went to him for the second part as well. So, cinematographers are as important if you think about it that way. Two exceptions, directors who are also cinematographers, Lars von Trier and David Lean. You are familiar with the works of von Trier, but what did David Lean make? Classics are not your strength. Passage to India, Lawrence of Arabia, remember these films. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. And writer, I mean, what does a writer do? He generally it is accepted that writers are at the bottom of the food chain and they are not at all important. Most controversial category because anyone has the right to interfere with a writer's work, especially directors, especially actors. Okay, they want to change a line, they can do that with without a buy or leave. So, film or screenplay or story is written, rewritten, renegotiated several times. So, what happens to the screenwriter? And then of course, you have composers and there are legendary composers who have added inimitable touches to a film. For example, we have uh, Coppola and Nina Richa, we were talking about them the other day, Godfather. Nolan and Hans Zimmer, legendary partnership and so is Sergio Leone and Ennio Morricone, Spielberg with John Williams. So, all these people make a movie, there, there is a very significant contribution which cannot be negated, actor, cinematographer, writer, composer. So, then what happens to the author? So, this is a question that I am throwing open to you, there, is, there are no answers as Kurosawa has already told us that there is no fixed truth. Now, uh, a quick, I mean, uh, we are doing so much of uh, directors and authors, so and we did not touch upon Howard Hawks at all. So, a quick look, a quick glimpse at uh, Howard Hawks, one of the greatest, one of the most successful directors of all times, and then we will move on to Hitchcock. So, Howard Hawks started his career as an aviator in the first world war. He joined the film industry and did several jobs including screenwriter, editor, assistant director, made uh, seven silent films for 20th century Fox productions. Who controlled Fox? Good, Zanuck. Major themes, ethics and professionalism. And I will give you a list of his all time great movies. Please do watch them whenever you have time. Focus on strong narratives. Most of his films deal with the theme of good versus evil. William Friedkin, we often talk about him, uh, Exorcist and the French Connection. And uh, he once met Howard Hawks, who was already in his 70s. And um, Howard Hawks gave him just one tip that, uh, you know, in most fr American new wave cinema, I do not find the good and evil. There should always be emphasis on the good versus evil. And one reason why all uh, after the initial successes that most American new wave directors met with there was a time after uh, when they started just flopping. <coughs> Most of their movies bombed and the entire cine new wave uh, uh, counterculture movement, it came to an end by uh, the late 70s, early 80s. Okay. And after that, you have been talking about the resurgence 
of the new Hollywood period uh, after the 90s, post 90s. Okay, so, that is another story altogether, but there was a time when stories focused only on good versus evil. Schwarzenegger, Stallone, there is an enemy, there is something. So, there is a strong Hollywood cinema, conventional cinema always goes for the good versus evil narrative and that is what uh, Howard Hawks advised William Friedkin to do. And his plots always offered a strong closure in the uh, tradition, in the great classic tradition of classic Hollywood cinema. Major films, Scarface and this is another name you should be familiar with, Ben Hecht. Many regard him as the greatest screenwriter of all times. If you look up Sid Field's screenwriting or uh, four great scripts, then you have to, uh, then you will come across Ben Hecht's name figuring very prom uh, prominently in his works. Scarface directed by Howard Hawks and produced by the great Howard Hughes, the aviator. However, the movie was so controversial that Hughes had to withdraw the movie from circulation for several years and it was not available till Hughes death in 1979. There must have been some censorship issues with it and Hughes had to withdraw the movie. Some great movies by Howard Hawks, The Road to Glory, one of his earliest ventures, Bringing Up Baby, Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn, His Girl Friday again with Cary Grant, The Big Sleep, based on Raymond Chandler's novel by the same title starring uh, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Red River is a western, John Wayne and Monty Clift, gentlemen prefer blondes, Malin Monroe and Rio Bravo again with John Wayne and Rio Bravo happens to be a favorite film of many of the new wave Hollywood filmmakers and also of Quentin Tarantino. Okay, any questions now here? I want you to watch a clipping from Rope, discuss the mise en scene. This is our opening title sequence. Observe that it is based on a play by Patrick Hamilton and then it was adapted in a screenplay by Arthur Laurentiis. Okay. Comments. Music, the opening, think of the, of the way the movie opens and then what it leads you into. It is a typical Hitchcock style. What is it telling you? It is a, when the movie opens, what, what scenes do we see? Street, Street scene? Okay. Okay. What else? The calmness. The calmness. Okay. What else? A lady pushing a stroller down the street. It's a normal, regular day, just like any other day. Uh, by the time the titles end, we also see a policeman helping two children crossing the road. That means, it is a very normal kind of a society, very peaceful, harmonious and then this is juxtaposed. And why is David killed? For no reason. It is just an experiment, a social experiment, a Darwinian experiment, survival of the fittest. And they, on a good day, they find, on a very ordinary good day, they find a friend of theirs who was uh, the most apt subject for this kind of experiment. They do not have any hostility, there is no reason for <coughs> committing this crime. You understand that? So, that is Hitchcock, okay. juxtaposing something uh, you know two uh, very radically opposite scenes and bringing out the difference. It is an ordinary day, ordinary human beings are doing mm, their business and then you have two people who think they are extraordinary and they have every right to kill a fellow human being, just because they want to carry out this kind of experiment. And we are also told 
later on if you have watched the movie, which is the philosophy implicit in the movie? Nietzsche's idea of Superman, okay, there is a Superman, okay, not the Superman, uh, the superhero Superman, but a, 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 a being which is intellectually and culturally superior to other beings and that is Nietzsche's definition, philosophy of Superman. Darwin also says the same thing, that is the uh, society is based on the principle of survival of the fittest. What else did you see? The music, it leads you into something, okay. So, from something very you know giving you an, the ordinariness of this day, it takes you into something more sinister, that is the kind of music. Now, let us talk about the set and the props, most important. the prop, the chest, okay. what else? The rope, the, the rope and the glass, the bottles, the bottles. and what else? Crystal set, yeah. which goes with the Harvard undergraduate uh, image that yes. we have. They have a taste for the better things of life. What about the New York skyline? Yeah, yeah what does it tell you? What time of the day it is? Evening. Because they say, so what a lovely evening. He does not say what a lovely morning or a day. He says, what a, it is very clearly stated, lovely evening. Perhaps it is 4 or 5 in the evening and everything happens in real time. Remember that. Okay. So, the passage of time is clearly stated there. And Hitchcock is telling you it is happening in real time because that is what. See, remember, rope was a big experiment for him, a very successful experiment for him. He wanted to make the movie in real time and something else he did with the editing part of it that we will talk about later. Okay. Then the gate subtext, that is important. You have to understand that the author Patrick Hamilton was the, 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 the writer on whose play the movie is based on. He was a known homosexual. Arthur Laurent is who adapted the, screen, the play into a screenplay was also a homosexual. The two actors, okay, and this is very important, John Dell and Granger, okay, um, Philip and Brandon, they are also known homosexuals, British actors. So, the, uh, the word gay, because you know you are still talking about the code days. Yeah, so, it is never ever implicitly stated, explicitly stated, but it is there, the subtext is there. The two men live together, they are throwing a dinner party together, they are going for a holiday together and we are also told later in the movie that Brendan is going to introduce Philip to his mother and he is going to sponsor. Uh, Philip's uh, music lessons and go is going to initiate his big concert, his life, his career into concert piano. But in this film, uh, stated, I forgot the name of uh, John Chandler's character. Mm. Uh, the David's fiance. David is not homosexual. No, no, David's fiance. And uh, where he says that you dated me once. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. But uh, you see, but he was never really interested in her. Who is he emotionally more involved with? Obviously, Philip. He is very flippant about his uh, very passing relationship. He must have dated her for a while and that is about it. You have to give maintain a facade of having a normal kind of life. So, he does say that I remember that before uh, uh, David, no before Kenneth there was me and now after Ken. Uh, after Ken it is David, yes. That imp uh, implication is definitely there. However, it does not mean that he was in a very serious relationship with her. He is definitely in a very serious re relationship with Philip and he is forever trying to control Philip. So, that is how you read into mise en scene. Anyway, the movie is so rich in mise en scene that it has to be watched over and again. 
yeah. So, canonization of Hitchcock as an author by French new wave critics. We all know that uh, Hitchcock in his homeland, in his own home turf was never recognized. You know the kind of respect or recognition he deserved was never accorded to him. We have already talked about it, but uh, the fr uh, French new wave critics were instrumental in building his reputation. And we are talking about the usual French critics, Bezon, Romer, Chabrol, Godard and Truffaut. And Truffaut has also famously written a book, not just written a book, but interviewed <coughs> Hitchcock, Truffaut on Hitchcock. It is a series of interviews. I recommend that you please go through that. Everything is available online. And Hitchcock was one of the first directors to whom they applied the theory of authorism. Hitchcock's uh, innovations and visions uh, have influenced a number of filmmakers and directors and we are going soon going to look at his legacy as well. And uh, Hitchcock was one of the uh, foremost filmmakers who started a trend for film directors to control artistic aspects of what of, of the movies without being answerable to the film's producers. So, th this is one of the foremost examples of a filmmaker trying to take control over the product rather than the producer. So, the name above the title. Francois, uh, Francois Truffaut's book or interview rather and it has come out in the form of book also uh, written with Helen Scott in 1966. It played a very important role in canonizing Hitch Hitchcock and promoting the director's authorial identity. Hitchcock was uh, almost always involved in every aspect of filmmaking. He decided who should star in his movies, he decided who should be the screenwriter. Remember, there are very Hitchcock, very few, uh, few Hitchcock movies which are based on original screenplays. He never wrote a screenplay. Most of his films are adapted. We have already uh, spoken about uh, his adaptation of Rebecca and Birds based on Daphne du Maurier's works. Strangers on a Train, who is the author? Patricia Highsmith, who later on wrote the very successful women. Patricia Highsmith, the Ripley work, talented Mr. Ripley. Okay. So, Patricia Highsmith is more uh, or better known for her Ripley work rather than strangers on a train. <coughs> Birds, no one was aware of its existence till Hitchcock took the story in his hands. So, he would develop the screenplay, but would uh, uh, it is very doubtful whether he actually wrote an original screenplay. Also influenced the soundtrack and the visual style. And if you look at a still one of the uh, posters of Psycho, then you see where else would you find director's picture so prominently displayed on the poster. And what is it telling you to do? be on time, okay, do not be late, that is Hitchcock telling you what to do. Okay. And no, I mean it, it was never done before Hitchcock, a director displaying his own photograph, you know splashing his photograph all over the poster. Otherwise, it, we have seen how uh, star dominated the entire situation the scene was. Again look at this is a poster from rear window and you have Hitchcock. So, this is Hitchcock's rear window. So, if you could digest psycho, then this is going to be more nerve rattling. And then here you have rope, which says that nothing ever held you like Alfred Hitchcock's rope. So, you see this is Hitchcock holding you, I am the maker, I am in control, a very clear and strong message. Some of his uh, most accepted 
aesthetics, features of aesthetics, invariably making a cameo appearance. He is there. Is he there in robe? He is one of the people crossing the street. Miso song, known for miso song, vertigo today is associated with the color green. And if you watch the movie, there is so much of green and red in the movie. You do listen to Vertigo's soundtrack. Go, go online today. Go to YouTube. Listen to Vertigo's soundtrack. It was so innovative for those days. All those electric instruments, unheard of those days. Bernard Herman, North by Northwest, Vertigo also, Psycho and Marnie. And of course, new wave Hollywood directors, so impressed they were. Uh, by Hitchcock, <coughs> that uh, who famously used Bernard Herrmann? Uh, Scorsese for taxi. taxi driver. Scorsese for taxi driver literally brought Herrmann out of uh, self imposed retirement. And Herrmann said, Who are you? I mean, I am used to working with the likes of Hitchcock, and what are you giving me? I have worked with James Stewart and on Vertigo and the classy Mr. Cary Grant on North by Northwest who would invariably you, uh, wear all these Gucci suits and you are giving me a movie about a taxi driver. So, no way I am going to do it, but then Martin Scorsese had it, his own, he, he would have made a, an offer he could not refuse and therefore, we had Bernard Hermans and it is a very haunting score in taxi driver. Michaelis Rosa in Spellbound, okay, you, it is also a very surreal movie starring Gregory Peck and Ingrid Bergman and some scenes, some stills from Spellbound, ostensibly a love story, Gregory Peck, Ingrid Bergman and in this movie, he collaborated with the surrealist uh, artist Salvador Dali and created that famous <laughs> dream sequence, where hero is being psychoanalyzed and I am not going to be a spoil sport, I would not tell you why the hero is being psychoanalyzed and what is the, how does the movie end. But here in this particular still you can see very surrealistic close ups of an eye, dream state or dream like state, Gregory Peck being psychoanalyzed and this was a scene, this was created by Salvador Dali in collaboration with Hitchcock. Now, coming to the movie that we have already talked about rope and we have already discussed how the opening of rope is something uh, depicting a very ordinary day, a very regular kind of day and then what happens subsequently. So, if you look at this particular uh, still, what is the mise en scene like? Setting the dining table. But what is the dining table? The chest. the chest. So, feeding off on David's grave, that is a, uh, that is something that James Stewart character says at the end, that you made us eat off his grave. Remember? And see how beautifully the scene is set up, it is an apartment, but not a very huge apartment, it has just very uh, limited number of rooms. And you can through this uh, point or through this per, uh, perspective, you can see the rest of the apartment till the kitchen. Setting up the table and the New York skyline and as the day closes, you can see the skyline also getting more and more darker and the lights coming up. And it was not uh, the movie might have been, uh, uh, it gives you the impression that is shot in real time, but of course, Hitchcock constructed this set. So, it is not the original New York skyline, remember that, it is a set and it must have taken him huge amount of resources and uh, uh, effort to create, recreate the New York skyline. Metonymy as mise en several times you see close up shots of hands. This is of course, James Stewart, this is the la, one of the climactic sequences where James Stewart comes with this rope. When does he come up with this scene, with this rope? 
Yes. Yeah, so yeah, and this rope, as we are told, it has already been given away to David's father. He has bought some books from uh, uh, Brandon, and Brandon very sadistically ties the books with the same rope with which he has killed Mr. Kentley's son, David. And James Stewart, when he returns to the apartment under the pretext of retrieving his cigarette case, he brings this rope and that is the thing that gives away the entire game, because Philip who is already at the edge now just come completely crosses it and uh, confesses that yes we did it. That is Hitchcock in the background, he is not just the person who crosses, but you can also see his face uh, all lit up by the neon lights. Okay, so, that is one instance of a very innovative use of mise en scene. And then, uh, this is something that I often refer to the kiss in notorious. And we are told during the Hayes code, the maximum length um, duration of a kiss was 3 seconds. Okay. So, 3 seconds, but what they did was to splice the long kiss with snatches of dialogue, with pieces of dialogue. So, actually, it is a 30 seconds kiss, but then it is broken into several parts. So, that is a kiss between Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman. I think this movie is also uh, referred to in Rope, remember? David's aunt, who is uh, one of the guests and she says, I just watched a movie with the Cary Grant and that Bergman woman and it is, what is it called? She says something, that is something, something, yes, so that is notorious. The long take in rope and now this is something that all of you should uh, understand very clearly because this is the way his Hitchcock played with the conventional ideas of editing. Okay, what did he do? Okay, so rope is seen as um, as a denial of the standard conventional traditional editing process, okay. a kind of negation or repudiation of its importance and power. Generally. <coughs> editing means having several shots but he and takes, but here there are lengthy takes and did you notice anything unusual in the editing of the movie, if you have watched the movie, the way it is edited. While I was watching the movie very recently for this class and I just thought what is going, because I, I had long take sequence in mind, did you notice anything unusual? It is an illusion of the movie being continuous shot. It is not an illusion, it is continuously shot, not the entire movie, but it has long takes 11, 10 to 11 minutes, okay, which is very unusual. But I am talking about an unusual scene in the movie, which gives you an impression that this is not something which would happen in a, in a normal movie. The camera takes you behind Brandon's back two times in the movie and his blue suit fills up the screen. And you wonder why is he doing that? It's just he's trying to. He he has cut the shot. He's cut the take, but he doesn't want the audience to note that. It's an experiment that works. Okay. So at the same time, the presence of the cut, despite his illusion, he 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 gives an illusion, as Vimal rightly points out, that it's not uh, actually the enti and the entire movie is not actually shot in one long take. There are cuts, but he gives the illusion. And this could be seen as the definitive test and proof of the very centrality that rope seems to deny. We will continue with our Hitchcock. Thank you very much.